Okay, Joel, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, gosh, all that intro is not going to be on the recording. Um, so uh, indulge me just a minute. Um, I want to show you not fly tying, but start with fly fishing. Uh, as we all are um, involved in uh, conservation and fish and clean water, uh, FFI, Trout Unlimited, so forth. I'm in Colorado, and Ross Reels recently uh, did a series of reels that came out in uh, different times. So I'll just show you here on the laptop camera. This is a Rio Grande cutthroat reel. So that's a moderate green color and has some special uh, paint and signatures on it. This is one of three. And I'm privileged uh, to own number one. So one, their limited series, 495. And this was a fundraiser for Colorado Trout Unlimited. So I have number one of each of those. There's three of them, a Colorado uh, greenback cutthroat, which is an endangered species, but has been restored. It's a state fish. There's also the uh, Colorado River cutthroat, so uh, very similar but different drainage. And then the uh, reel I showed you was the Rio Grande. Rio Grande headwaters in Colorado runs all the way to Texas and the Gulf of Mexico. So um, uh, those three reels are part of the fundraiser that uh, Ross Reels did. So I'm very proud of Ross for doing that, and um, because of some of my involvement, I got to get number one of all three of them, so I have a collection that uh, I kind of brag about, so that's kind of fun. Anyway, um, I wanted to uh, do something a little different tonight with uh, jig hooks. Put that aside, and... Um, you know, jig hooks in general have been used for many years. They're not new, particularly uh, to the spectrum of saltwater fishing. And uh, my first introduction was many, many years ago to jig hooks for uh, crappie, crappie jigs and uh, warm water fishing. In the trap fishing world, uh, they, uh, while not brand new, are relatively recent, and hook manufacturers have begun to expand their offerings in that, um, you know, in the world of metal beads. First, there were no beads, you know, we just tied a hair's ear with no bead. And then along came uh, gold and silver beads, brass beads. And we maybe thought that was a fad at first, pretty weird, but works and has continued. And then along came tungsten beads. And then more recently uh, with the combination of jig uh, head hooks, there are slotted tungsten beads now. So the availability of slotted tungsten beads and um, they're not cheap, but the cost has come down on those. So uh, more and more those are being used instead of brass beads and they come in all different colors from the traditional gold and silver, copper, black and so forth. You can get rainbow colors, you can get faceted tungsten beads. So I'll not get into all that tonight, but I'm just making the point that it's just another evolution in fly tying. And for me as a longtime fly tire, I've been messing with it for a few years, but maybe not so much others, particularly if you are um, either new to fly tying or um, maybe you uh, live in a state that doesn't have the faster uh, 
pocket water that some of the Intermountain West states do. So these jig head tungsten bead flies really sink fast and fish a little different. So I'll get into that. What I wanted to share first, and now we might do this as a tip one time or something. Um, here's a box I put together. So when you go to the store, your local shop, uh, the beads and hooks come in, you know, packages of 20, 25. You can buy a bunch of packages. If there's a particular pattern you tie often, you'll buy more of those and maybe none of the other sizes or something. But I kind of got tired of um, just messing around, finding the packages, not knowing where everything was or being out of them or something. And so also with jig hooks and tungsten beads, um, while they're pretty much the same, uh, you can interchange different brands of beads and hooks. Sometimes you'll find different hook manufacturers versus bead manufacturers. They don't quite work so well. Or maybe one size will work with one company and another size won't or something. So that consistency was irritating to me. So that's why I put this together. I just got a whole bunch of them. This is a pill box. The pill boxes come in all different uh, shapes, square, round, seven days and so forth. But I was able to find this one. Took a lot of looking online. That's sort of like a fly box. And then inside of it, these individual little boxes, see that a little bit. So each little individual box opens up. And so inside I put together that. So what I have here for my fly tying demos and different uh, uh, travel situations, I just put all this together and I have multiple sizes of, if I can hold this up without dumping it, I have multiple sizes of jig hooks on this side, 8 through 20, and then I put together all of the uh, bead sizes from uh, 2 aught to 3.8, that's millimeters, and we'll look at a chart here. And I've got it in black, copper, silver, and gold. Yes, so sir. it's kind of a fun little thing. It keeps it all together right for me. I can travel with it. I can do a demo with it. Because, you know, they'll spill, and it's pretty hard to find them and keep up with them. So a little idea for you to use um, some different um, kind of box there. It's got locking lids, so I'm pretty comfortable with that, that I'm not going to lose. Because beads, you know, you don't need much space. If you use a traditional hook box, you know, a plain O or a clear type of box with the individual compartments, you know, you, the beads are pretty small. You got a big box, but not a lot of space occupied because everything's so small, the hooks and the beads. So this is a way to make it compact and locking. So just anyway, I thought I'd share that a little bit. So, Bill, um, can, can, I, yeah. can I interrupt for just a second? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody's, somebody's not muted. I can hear Hmm. something in the background so i'm going to mute everybody from here and you'll have to unmute yourself to be able to talk okay you need to unmute yourself now there we go got it got it got it okay um before i start with a hook and a bead any other questions or thoughts on that Nope, I think that's just background, right? Okay, uh, well, yep. I'll start with the first pattern here. So um, we've shared this on uh, Al's Friday night videos before. Let me switch over to my vice camera. Okay. Um, these uh, magnetized 
clips I've been using. So this is the first fly I'm going to tie. Get it uh, set up there against the vise head. So this is called a 20 incher. And uh, that's the finished fly, what it's going to look like. A 20 incher is a long time traditional uh, Western United States, Rocky Mountain region uh, stone fly imitation. So that particular pattern is not exceptionally new. It's not the pattern that's new, but what I've done with a number of patterns is adapt them to a jig hook. And there's some process involved in that. And so you could take any traditional nymph pattern, particularly a bead head pattern, and convert it to a jig hook. So here's a jig hook. using Al's handy dandy little clips there. So come in all different sizes, but of course the main difference of a jig hook is that turn down shank in front of the eye. And in order to make a bead go around that corner, it's not a rounded corner, a traditional brass bead won't work with that. So, Put that in the vise and mount one up here. Put that in focus a little bit, maybe. So <clears throat> I've already picked out, so that's a size eight. And let me switch to the screen sharing. And I'll show you this. Uh, chart does that come up yes it did okay so that's a chart of beads and hook sizes and how to match them up or smaller hooks smaller beads larger hooks larger beads so traditionally the brass beads have been described in the uh English system of uh, inches. And so at the top there in the middle column, 1 16th of an inch, 5 64ths of an inch, all the way down to 7 30 seconds being the larger one. So small at the top, large at the bottom. More and more, particularly with the advent of um, Euro nymphing, uh, the slotted tungsten beads are not in the English system. They're in the metric system. So over on the left is a chart of millimeters, starting at 1.5, going down to 5.5. So for my arsenal for trout fishing flies, you know, mostly in the middle. Most of the flies you tie would be in the 2.0 to the 3.8 range. And then you can go over to the right in the hook sizes and you can see then how you can match that up to the hook sizes. So for example, on the smaller spectrum, uh, a 2.0 millimeter hook or a bead would do a 18 to 20 size hook. And most of uh, the larger hooks that I tie, not that you couldn't do bigger, but uh, 3.8 uh, converts to an 8 to 10 uh, hook. And I'd, I'd note that uh, certainly just like you would do with nymphs with or without a bead, uh, if you're looking to imitate some of the bigger insects like the stoneflies, uh, you might take a uh, size 10 or 8 hook, but instead of a standard length shank, you'd use a uh, 2x or 3x shank. So you still would use the 3.8 bead, but to get a bigger fly, you would use a longer shank hook. Okay, any questions about that chart? Are there approximate weights, or is that just 
vary by the material. I mean, tungsten will be different than lead. It will be different than brass, et cetera. Right. So, um, yes, the tungsten is a denser material. So for the same size, it has a higher weight. Uh, I don't I guess I couldn't quote you off the top of my head what a certain size of bead would weigh, but certainly a tungsten bead, that's the point of the tungsten that it, uh, the use of the tungsten is that it, uh, all else equal, it'll sink faster because it's denser and heavier. Okay, well, just kind of some information there. So if you're wondering how to match up, you go to the shop and there's a whole uh, uh, wall of fly tying materials and hooks and beads and which one goes with what, then uh, there's a chart you can use. That's all available out on the internet or maybe we can uh, share that later or something. Okay, go back to my camera device, right? Okay, so uh, how do you mount a B. There's lots of different tools, lots of different kinds of bead tools or just some little plastic tweezers. I've used these. Frankly, they don't work very well. There are traditional tweezer, tweezers. You can see some serrated blades in there. Of course, this type, type of regular tweezer requires you to squeeze to hold it so you have to have pressure and with beads that can be um, problematic sometimes they'll just pop out there are certain bead tweezers i'll show you one that i like that does work pretty well uh, is this one this is a dr slick version so this is a reverse pliers so when you squeeze it opens and then when you let go, it'll hold the bead without you. So I'll pick one up here. And you can see there how that bead is sitting in there. This particular bead tool works pretty well with the larger beads. This is the 3.8 that I'm going to use here in a minute. But when you get down to the small ones, uh, it's not so good for whatever reason that uh, rubber doesn't hold them, they pop out. So you kind of have to experiment and learn different ones. Here's some <clears throat> inexpensive reverse pliers. So again, when you squeeze them, they open. And then when you let go, it holds them. So here's that same bead inside of those reverse pliers or reverse tweezers. So this one works pretty well. They come also on a little curved head. Either one's good. They're pretty inexpensive. So to mount the bead on the hook, there's lots of different ways. You can do it in your hands, particularly with the larger beads. That actually works pretty well, uh, where just because of the larger size, you can see the holes, you can grab them in your fingers. Small ones can be uh, pretty difficult, a small bead on a small hook. I'm going to show here how that fits over on the point of this hook, but if, if that's the only way that you can manage to hold a hook, particularly a very small one, is to capture a device that works. I just say like um, many kinds of... Uh, steps in fly tying that have nothing to do with beads, just different ways we tie. Sometimes it's good if you're tying particularly a dozen or more, uh, you would do a dozen hooks and beads all at once. You wouldn't do them one at a time. Not that that's bad, but just a little more efficient to go do a dozen hooks and beads and uh, set them aside and have them ready for the next time. So. I'll pick that one up here and show you if I can get it just right with the blue background. See the, let me lean it against, there, is that pretty good? 
So you can see the round hull. So that's basically the same as a traditional brass bead, that round hole on the one side. The difference with a tungsten bead with the slot, you can see how it's opened and has a slot to it. And so the reason for that, as I mentioned earlier, is to get around the uh, edge of the jig. Now this particular hook is barbed. You can bend down the barb if you'd like also. Some of the beads require that. If you're doing a um, larger hook with a barb on it and you're trying to put a very small bead on it, you may not get it over the barb or you can start with a barbless jig hook. They do offer those also. And so I'm going to just get that. So I'm going to always, you always mount the smaller round hole onto the point of the hook. And then if you'll just turn it a little bit, that slot will find a place and it'll move on down to the bend of the hook. So you can see it. I'm going to push it all the way around here. And now you can see just by itself, it didn't make that bend of the jig. But again, if you'll just roll it around some, it'll find its home there. A brass bead generally would not do that. It wouldn't make that bend. So you want the small hole towards the eye. If you get it backwards, you could still use it. You could still tie it, but the slot would if you had it backwards where the slot was touching the uh, ring of the eye, it would slide on down and partially cover the eye. And of course, then you couldn't get your tippet through it and so forth. So it's important that you get the small hole first and the larger slotted hole on the back side. Now, this one is a single tungsten bead, but like other nymph patterns, stonefly patterns. You could do more. Here's an example. I'm not going to tie this, but there's two beads. You could put a slotted tungsten bead on the front, and then I've added a smaller brass bead behind that. And I can use a brass bead on that because it doesn't have to go all the way forward to the angle of the jig hook. And of course, you combine different colors and make up what you want. So maybe thoughts or questions for our mounts and thread and keep going? What was that, Joel? I'm sorry. Yeah, maybe stop a minute for questions about uh, beads and hooks and mounting. Any, any questions on that before I mount the thread and keep going? Okay, yeah. Yeah, this was built. Possibility of maybe gluing some really thin ED foam to one side of those uh, tight pliers might be able to hold the small hook. Yeah, I haven't tried that. Uh, have you got something like that? Like the one millimeter or something like that, you know, on one side, and then you've got at least uh, the ridge on one side, and you've got the soft foam to encase it, and then you've basically made yourself a little uh, castle to capture it. I mean, just thinking out, out the outside the box. Right, you know, yeah, yeah. Ruin, off you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be another idea. Uh, let's think about that. Here's here's another Joel, one. I, Joel, I found that uh, I use a bodkin to pick my beads up and put them on the hook. Uh, yep, okay, so like this here, I'll just do that. Uh, show, got to get my... Uh, uh, reader glasses on here. So here's a bodkin. Here's a bead. Find that hole. And like that, what you're talking about, and then join the two points, slide it off, all right? That's another way. Yep. Yep. Uh, you all the, uh, some hackle pliers. Here's, here's a hackle plier with some rubber tips. 
those will hold beads also. Again, kind of depends on what beads you're using. Hey, Joel. Yeah. I use a pair that I bought at a bead shop, and it's kind of like the Dr. Slick's ones you showed. Yes. But it doesn't have the rubber on it. It's uh, it's kind of like the serrated ones that you showed, uh, but this has no serrations. But what it has is a tiny little cup on both sides. Yes. So um, what will you sell that to me for? <laughs> 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 There's been a lot of guys trying to buy this one, but yeah, I've seen I've seen them on Amazon, but I can't think of what they're called right now. I'll ask my wife; she's a bead jeweler. So, well, yeah, well, unless somebody else in the jewelry industry makes them or something, uh, uh, yeah, they're called uh, Easy Bead Tool. There's different names for them. They were manufactured commonly for a while when um brass beads first came out you could get them online or shops and so forth i have searched high and low they do not make them anymore i've all um i've I even just... called the uh, company like wapsi uh was the distributor for that and i'm just told they don't make them anymore they're not available when you look online and i spent hours doing this everywhere there are a lot of places that will show them as an item online but when you get to the uh card or checkout or something they're always out of stock yeah um if you got a big bead store uh, i know beads haven't uh they've dropped in popularity uh for the gals over what they were but uh uh if you have happened to have some place in town that has a big bead store and you might be able to pick them up there and I actually saw a pair at um, Hobby Lobby's about a year and a half ago, but I didn't think about buying them at that time, and I wish I would have. Rick? Rick? Yeah? Yeah, uh, I got one of these, uh, what you're talking about, that's got two holes in the uh, bevel, you know, inside the tip. Yeah. And it's got this little plastic thing you slide forward to put pressure on to hold it and when i look at it it says bead navers registered patent pending and then it says jade river incorporated let's see if i got anything on this one that mine doesn't have any having plastic thing on it it's it's one of those reverse uh reverse yeah, style yeah, this one isn't a reverse style, but it's got the two little cavities on either side up here by the tips. But it's wow. it's it's Jade River Incorporated is the company. Yeah, all mine says a stainless Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> but um I don't know. For the right price, I might. I might <laughs> let go of one of the two that I have. <laughs> <laughs> We'll talk, Joel. <laughs> I have an auction, the highest bidder. So, um, yeah, I'd like to get my hands on some of those. Um, you know, if you could acquire some new ones, uh, great, find a source. But I, I did look extensively and couldn't find them. And so, you know, they're out there from people that have purchased them when they were available. And they're sitting in some boxes and tying tools and so forth so um maybe i'll find one at a show or something somewhere you never know but um yeah um they're they're worth their weight in gold but that dr slicks one doesn't look too bad but i don't know about little beads yeah yeah the dr slick ones are available now but they do not have the uh cupped uh hole in the half hole in each side of the tweezers that helps to hold the bead. And that's the problem with regular tweezers and different size. The mm -hmm. pressure on them, they just pop out because there's nothing to kind of grab them. Maybe so, something called a bead crimping tool. Okay. I'll have to buy a couple and I'll I'll, I'll order one or two and see what they see if they work. Yeah, so when you get those in, share that on a yeah later call, and we'll see if that's 
workable. Hey, Joel, this is uh, Alan Kier. I'm not too familiar with, uh, you know, using beads for stream fishing, but one thing that I do a lot is, especially with uh, lead eyes, tungsten eyes, bead chain, you're always trying to affect where that fly is going to be in the water column. I'm looking at your hook with a bead, and it seems to engage from that bend right to the uh, back of the eye of the hook. Is that whatever bead you use and whatever material, is that the position you want? Or could you, is it, you know, if you used a smaller bead, I assume um, it would definitely have to be a slotted bead. Uh, that chart you showed earlier, um, was that for a solid bead or is that for slotted? It seems mm -hmm. like slotted gives you a lot more variance in the, in the size. Um, I guess uh, my two questions are, whatever bead you put, does it go from the bend at the neck there to the, you know, like the way you have it, it looks like a perfectly sized bead for whatever pattern you're tying, or could you use one two thirds of size if you wanted to have one that's less uh, heavy in the front? Yes. So, yes. So that's where you get into different Sizes of hooks and beads match up. Uh, so this is a uh, on the camera on the hook that you're looking at is a um, size A hook with a barb, and that's a 3.8 millimeter bead. So on that same hook, to your point, you could drop down. The next size is 3.3, .3, and you could mount a 3.3 .3 on that. And so, sure, just like in the past, how we may have added uh, more or less <laughs> lead to the shank of the hook or more or less wire ribbing or, you know, a thread or floss ribbing instead of wire to vary the weight and sink rate. Uh, yeah, what you said, certainly you could change the size of the bead to a point, it would be uh, it, at some point the smaller bead, in, in this case in my box I showed you, the small ones I have are mm -hmm. point zero. They would, well actually I have one because that's going to be in the um, second pattern I do. Here's a um, uh, 2.0, no that's a, sorry, that's a 2.3 bead. And you can see the difference in size there, but that bead, even with the slot, would not go around the bend of the hook in the jig on this one. So there'd be a point of no return that there, there you could use several different sizes, but not every size. Does that make sense? And then another thing when you're tying these, the, yeah. the larger ones, uh, give you some good space behind the bead to tie in other things with, with you can have a bigger head not a mm. traditional smooth head like we tie on a dry fly but you can get more stuff behind that bigger bead if you go to a smaller bead you have to be careful with the size of your materials and your threads or it'll just slip over the top of the bead mm-hmm um, this is Bill. I, you know, being a novice, what I, I learned, and it's just a part of practice, is when I was casting double uh, bead-chained uh, flies, you know, for the Project Healing Waters event, I couldn't cast them very well with my five weight. It just didn't seem to get there. Now, that's probably a technique issue, but I found it was a lot easier to use the nine weight to pitch them and get them out there. So it's just potentially... Maybe weight may have an impact on your cast and adjustment. Oh yeah, very definitely. I think so. And and you know, that's not just applicable to beads and tungsten beads. Even you know, hook flies tied with lead in them. Anything that has some weight, you have to slow down and open up the loop in your cast even with a single fly 
and I very commonly fish at least two nymphs and sometimes three. So uh, you have to be very careful about that and the weight of all that swinging around, uh, like you're saying with the bead chains and eyes, um, particularly in larger hooks that you might be using for uh, warm water fish. Yeah, you'd have to, I think, be um, wanting to have a, a higher weight fly rod. So something like this, you can work it with a five weight fine, uh, unless there's some wind or something, then maybe you're up to a six or an eight weight. But, you know, where I commonly fish in Colorado, the rivers aren't that huge compared to some of the Midwest and uh, Northwest rivers uh so the the a five weight work ride works pretty well okay um i'm gonna call time out on the 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 questions right now and uh we'll let joe get moving down the road here yeah so uh the first part of this when you tie these jig flies uh every, every pattern's a little bit different, but this first part is not going to be any different than if you were tying a traditional nymph for 20 incher, meaning I've got the shank up and I'm going to put some goose biots on. I could wrap multiple wraps of thread, build a ball there to help spread the uh, biots that are yet to come here. Uh, one little Shortcut for that, nothing new, is uh, particularly when you're using a larger size uh, hook and this thread is a, a six aught. And so it's going to take a lot of wraps to push that around and build up enough of a ball. Instead, I'm going to just kind of speed it up a little by putting some uh, dubbing right there on it. Like that'll make a ball. Something else I do that probably you don't, maybe if you do, a tag. <clears throat> you know, a lot of old style flies had a tag of silver or gold or something. I just use my thread to make a tag. I think that uh, helps. To... <clears throat> Oops, I bumped my camera. Uh, I think that helps to, um... is that in focus? Let me work on that just a little bit. There you go. Yep. Um. It just helps take away the shininess of it. You know, it, we've always talked about, we, we tie all these imitations from the shank to the eye of flies, particularly dry flies, and try to be very realistic. And then <clears throat> no matter what we do, we always got this big lump of metal sticking out the back end that looks nothing like a fly, right? So putting a tag on it there, at the very end, for me, just adds a little color and covers up a little bit of the uh, uh, shininess of the hook, particularly the larger ones. So just something I do on all of my uh, nymphs is put a tag down the bend before I come back to the front. So I just put on a um, ball of dubbing there. I'm going to use for this particular pattern goose biots. For the tail, you could use rubber legs and other synthetic materials. I'm just spreading them up there a little bit so I can clip off two of them. Keep those two and you can, I don't like those, I want some bigger ones. Hold on just a sec. Where'd my bigger one go? Here they are. Little bigger ones for this bigger hook. So I'm going to take a couple of those. You can mount them one at a time, but with some practice, you can do both of them. And crossed and evened up in your fingers a little bit. We'll put it right on top there. You can get them measured longer or shorter, how you want. Transfer your hand, stick your thumbnail right down on top of them. 
So lost the one. And they're not going anywhere while you secure those butts. And before you let go of them, get that thread right up against that ball of dubbing. And that'll spread them like a real stonefly tail. Real stoneflies, the tails are very short. We tend to exaggerate that. Maybe that's a good thing, but um, particularly with rubber legs, I think they sort of get too long and too crazy sometimes. So I don't know, just been doing this a long time. I like the buyouts. You can, for the larger ones, particularly if you were uh, larger size hooks, particularly if you were tying a longer shank hook, like a 3X, then uh, you could even go to turkey buyouts. Okay, next, um, again, this is kind of all same, nothing nothing new at this point. I have a um, piece of wire here. Oh, I forgot. Uh, Rick, you let me forget. I'm going to switch cameras here and go to my little material area. So uh, we talked about the hooking the bead, but uh, I'm going to use the uh, goose biots for the tail. I'm going to use peacock for the body. I've got some wings I'm going to do with brown Swiss straw. I'm going to put some rubber legs on it. This is lead, optional with the tungsten bead, normally most patterns would not add lead, but you certainly could. And then uh, the ribbing is a uh, copper wire. Uh, and uh, uh, this is pretty shiny, so it doesn't show up very well uh, with light, but that's a box of dubbing. I've used um, Spirit River Squirrel Blend for years. Nice dubbing. There's lots of different brands and combinations out there. I like squirrel blend because with nymphs, when you dub it, the pieces of the, the fibers of squirrel in it, they don't pack down. They keep sticking out. So you can get the bulk and fuzziness of the dubbing, but the squirrel then kind of hangs out and gives some uh, character to the fly. Okay, let's see, back to the vise. So I'm going to add the wire here. So uh, off of this spool of wire, <clears throat> let me get it in the other hand here. It's just ultra wire in a um, large size copper color. You can vary whatever colors you want, typically gold. This is going to be peacock body, so it needs to be something lighter colored and shiny that'll show up against the peacock. And then uh, because of the slot in the bead, if I can get that in there and turn that around just right. If you can see that slot in the bead there on the back side. There's plenty of room there to put the end of this wire. You could start the wire anywhere halfway, and you would do that if you were going to uh, add lead weight on the front half of the shank. You'd only do your wire halfway, just enough to uh, catch it so you can uh, wrap it around for ribbing later. I'm not going to take the time in this pattern to add wire, but I just want you to see that that butt end of the wire can go into the slotted hole of the bead and then just with some wide wraps up to the bead you're just adding a little more weight but you're also uh, keeping the uh, uniformity of the uh, body of the fly right there before we get to something else so i'll just put that out of the way a little bit come back later for the ribbing and again, this part is not specific to a jig fly. You do this with a traditional shank up nymph. So I've gone to my peacock, just picked 
six or eight strands. That's probably a little too many right there. Pull out some of the shorter ones. Got one shorter one right there. Clip that off, get them even. So we got one short one right there. And I'm going to mount that on top with just one little easy wrap there. And so I don't have to trim it. I'm just going to pull it so it's right behind that bead, and then I can work it backwards to capture. And of course, Peacock uh, uh, is delicate. So to solve that, just make a thread rope out of the peacock, wrap it around a number of times. If you did a real long shank hook, you might have to do this a couple of times. I think I can manage this once. So with those wraps around, then that peacock's got the thread built into it, give it a little bit of strength. Don't want to go too far here because I got to have room for some wings and other stuff towards the front. Now that I have got it where I want, I can just pull apart. With one hand, I'm going away with the thread and the peacock in the opposite direction. And they will, oops. Came out of my spring holder there. We'll separate that rope, capture it with a couple of wraps of thread. And then I'm going to trim that off. Don't trim it too close. You get way down here, you're like, okay, I want to keep it nice and clean. Remember that thread's in there. So I've got to uh, trim it a ways up a little bit. And before it gets away from me, put a few wraps to capture that. And add my ribbing. I'm going to counter wrap this. Capture that wire. Now, I'm a fan of uh, just cutting wire, particularly this heavy wire. If you try to helicopter that, you'll be all day on the heavier wire. You could cut it with your scissors back in the back of your blades. Uh, these are replaceable blades, so that's kind of okay, but always have handy just a fake whisk scissors. And I can come in with them, and they're cheap. I don't care, and cut that wire. So to that point, it's really just a traditional tie. This is where the jig changes technique. So we're going to invert that because the idea of a jig hook and the tungsten bead is for the head with the bead to sink down further and lower than the point of the hook. So the point of the hook rides up and that serves two very proven important points. One is you get less snags on the bottom if you're fishing that close to the bottom, rocks and twigs and debris and so forth. But also with that hook point when hopefully when it's in the water, Flies tumble, so it's not always going to be this way, but the idea is that the fly would ride like that. So not only does it not get snagged up, but when a trout sticks his mouth around that, it's probably got a better hookup. So the inverted pattern, rather than tying the wing case and other materials on the top of the shank, I'll focus just a little bit. There. The um, wing case and other materials are tied on the bottom of the shanks. So they have to turn the hook over. And that's where it gets a little bit challenging with these because one of the reasons I like this style of ice is how clean it is on top and how much room you have to manip manipulate materials and your fingers when you're tying the traditional way with the shank up. When you invert this, 
if the opposite happens, now that hook point is in your way of your thread and everything else going on here. So you don't have as much room. So it takes a little more dexterity and control to uh, work this that way. Okay, I'm gonna add just a little bit of dubbing. And the purpose here is simply to add a little bulk and fill this up a little bit. I wanna leave some space there. I don't wanna fill this up entirely. And then I'm going to add my Swiss straw wing. So I've got the Swiss straw on a card. Flip a section of that off. Swiss straw, I love this for now. When you tie this in, if you haven't tried it, it actually is folded and lapped over as it's manufactured. But when that gets wet, it expands. So particularly for wings, when a more realistic wing would be a little bigger and puff up. Swiss straw will do that when it gets wet. So in your box, it may be kind of narrow and thin, but after you fish it a while, it'll fluff up. So I'll just move on pretty quickly here. Just a thin piece of dubbing, just to add a little size to the thorax and Cover up my thread wraps. To make that Swiss straw lean over, I'm going to come in with a bodkin and pull it over. My intent here is instead of a flat traditional wrap like you do a hair's ear or something, I want the Swiss straw to stick up. So I'm going to use my bodkin to sort of measure that. And now I've got a point of thread. I point a straw that sticks up. And when I capture that, pull some pretty tight on it. That will give it some three dimension and stick up like a real wing case. Again, just a little bit of dubbing, cover that up. I'm going to add rubber legs here. So the rubber legs come on the uh, bulk. There's all different uh, colors and combinations. I like the white. I think that just catches the attention somewhat, shows up particularly in dirty water. One strand is too long for the rubber legs. So I'm gonna use one strand, double it over, Cut it in half, and that'll give me legs for both sides then. Now I've got half a strand. I'm going to put that behind my thread, double it over on the thread. Get it even there. Now I can just torque that around. So I'm just taking it, lifting it up, pulling it over to the back side. And those rubber legs will stand out. Now I'm going to take one, maybe two wraps backwards. So the further back you wrap, the more that will bend that rubber leg towards the back, which is okay on the back one. But we don't want that happening too much on the front one. If you were to torque it around, the front one would get in too far into your other materials and your eye the hook when you're doing your wet finish later. So I want the back ones to lay back a little bit, but the front one's not too much. So that's the back side. Take my other half. Get it in the middle there pretty close. Torque it right against the front side. So with the front side in the camera and the vise here, you can see that a little better. I've got one wrap of the thread there. I'm going to go another wrap. Push that leg on the back side. Back against the body of the hook just a little bit. But not so much on the front side. And again, just to cover up the thread and add a little book bulk. Very light wrap of dubbing there. Now I'm going to move that. Um, 
thread in front of the Swiss straw. So for two wings, again, I'm going to put that bodkin in there, lay it over, make it fold over. Hold it in my fingers a little bit. Hold it pretty tight. Got a second wing hanging out there. You come in, we'll use some thinner, narrower scissors here. Turn away that excess Swiss straw. Now I can move that thread in front with the Swiss straw and the rubber legs. From there. Oh, let's see. Whoops, a little bit more dubbing right there. With the whip finish, hope you can kind of see this in the camera. I'm coming in front of the rubber leg. I don't want to capture that. I'm pushing my loop over the top of the bead, but I've got to come down over the eye of the hook and in front of that other rubber leg. You can do a couple of whip finish there. Okay, now last thing is just simply you can leave these legs long. You might like that, particularly in the larger flies. A real stone fly has some pretty short legs. You might want to trim them off. So I'm kind of going to go in the middle there. I'm just finding the point there. Trying to make them about the same, a little shorter on the front. A little longer in the back. So that's the finished fly there. So that's how it would look to the fish with the legs and the wings. Sure, I'm in focus here. Let me open up the up that light a little bit. So there, there we go. Hope you can see that a little bit. So that's just a 20 incher with a jig hook and tungsten bead. I call all these jiggy something. So a jiggy 20 incher. The next one I'll tie is called a jiggy miracle. You could do a jiggy hair's ear, you know, um, a jiggy zug bug, whatever you tie. So that's how it would fish to the look to the fish, but this is how it looks in your vise. Questions or thoughts on that one before I go to another one? Rick. I really liked how you I really liked how you took the uh, thread and wrap your peacock uh, pearl around it to give it, because it is right. It is just breaks all the time on me. And that was a really good idea, especially when you said to be careful that you don't cut too close to that peacock because you will cut your thread. And that yeah. was a good reminder for me. Well, I didn't figure that out on my own. That was taught to me by the very illustrious Albedi many, many years ago. So there you go. Thank you. All right. No questions in chat.
So maybe I'll just say a minute before I go to the next one how you'd fish this. We talked a little bit earlier about a um, um, the cast and the rod weight and so forth. Um, you know, you can use this anywhere. There is a uh, small to medium sized pocket water as a single fly with the tungsten bead, and especially if you were to uh, add some additional weight by either putting lead in the front or a second bead like I showed you earlier, it's going to drop very hard. Um, you could fish it with a traditional nymph set up with one or two nymphs with uh, with or without uh, a weighted leader and a strike indicator. Uh, because of the tungsten bead, it's going to drop pretty hard and fast, particularly if you've got a second fly on it. So what I like to do with this one, as long as I've got, say, um, two to three feet or more of depth in a run or a pool or a pocket, is use two flies with this on the front, and you'll catch flies if it's, it's your first lead fly. Tie on um, a second uh, fly, uh, either this the eye of this hook is big enough, you can get two strands of tippet in the eye, so you could tie your second fly on through the eye or either to the bend of the hook uh, or tag, and particularly a smaller traditional, maybe even non-beaded nymph that would tend to ride up. So the tungsten bead is going to go down hard and fast and kind of straight, and maybe uh, two feet of tippet off the back of that. Your second fly is not right on the bottom. So you're kind of covering two portions of the water column, bottom to middle, if you will, and maybe the flash and size of the a uh, larger 20 inch or any similar type of tungsten pattern is what the trout sees, but they very, very often take that smaller fly. Particularly, I think uh, the more and more good or bad, the more and more fishermen we have, the more and more people that are on the water, the more and more the fish are. I don't think they're smart, but you know, they become kind of uh, reactionary trained. We we have had to move to smaller flies where a 12 used to be small, and then a 16 was small, and now we're into less that. So you can do a second fly behind this. It might be a 16-18. Uh, uh, that's very effective. And then I love it in uh, short pocket water. Some of the rivers we have, like the Taylor, the Eagle, the Roaring Fork, uh, you may have a, a um, pocket that's no bigger or smaller than a dinner table and you got to get down very quick or else by the time the fly gets down it's already the water speed is uh taking it out to the bottom of the hole and you've missed the fish and especially where you're working with a dry dropper where uh you would uh for a tungsten bead of course you have to have a very large heavy foam or whatever dry that'll float but put it on a very short uh, tip it so instead of a uh, 20 inches off the bend of the hook, maybe only 10 inches. And that heavy tucks to be it plops right down in front of their face real quick. You get a hook up real quick, you better have your uh, slack out of your line and be ready for a tug. Okay, well, um, let's see what is it? Uh, uh 10 after the next one, I think will go pretty quickly, and I'll just move on here. This is, <clears throat> we've already demonstrated how to um, mount the bead. And let's see, I'm going to go back to uh, the uh, screen sharing. I didn't share the recipes, Rick. Let me, let me see if I can get that up here. Uh, let's see, where are those? Uh, I didn't load them up first. Oh, goodness. 
Um, well, I can't do that, can I? Let's see here. No, I didn't load them up first, so I don't think I can do that without leaving the Zoom, getting back to my desktop. Okay. Uh, what we can do is uh, um, send them to me, and we will get them out to everybody. Okay. How's that sound? Well... Guess that's our only choice. I don't like that because I put them all together beforehand. So I know, <laughs> and they look good. <laughs> um, so this one's called a jiggy miracle. A miracle nymph is traditionally a, a very small nymph, very mm. uh, effective, uh, pink-bodied white floss, and some wire ribbing on it. Uh, traditionally, it was not even tied with a bead and maybe a 16 18 size uh intended uh you know somewhat as a um, midge maybe a large midge but nonetheless uh, that's kind of the profile well with euro nymphing that um and our uh sophistication of equipment of lines and uh, gear then we've kind of evolved into some of these flies that are a little bigger so that's what this is instead of a 16. I've got this on a size 12 hook mostly for um, demonstration purposes. And here's what the completed fly is going to look like. So that's where we're going. So I'm tied in a bigger size, but more normally, this is a uh, 16 tied in something smaller. So I'll stick with the bigger one just uh, to help see it on the camera, but tie it down smaller also. Okay, so I've already got the jig hook, got the bead. I'm using a gold bead. Uh, this one is a uh, uh, 2.4 bead on a size 12 hook. And I'm going to switch over my materials here. I'm actually going to, you could use pink thread and add some steps to it, but I've learned that if you'll just learn how to use floss as thread, you'll save extra steps in mounting. So I'm just going to mount the floss as if it were the thread. And you can see the floss right at the shank of the hook spreads out. It'll cord up as we go. So if that becomes a problem, you can uh, counterclockwise rotate your bobbin and it'll spread that out. So I'm just kind of looking for a smooth, even uh, covering of the hook shank right now. Then, as always in fly tying, the last will be first. So, um, I'm going to use a little lighter wire on this one. This is also copper wire, but it is a brassy size. So, it's a little thinner wire. A little piece of that off and just like the previous pattern I'm going to get that wire up into the hole of the tungsten again trying to keep a little smoothness to the body <clears throat> off that floss flared out some kind of important on the initial body but not later. Now, I don't want to go too far because sort of to the question earlier about different size, sizes of beads on different hooks. If I used particularly a smaller bead, but even this one, I'm going to put a bunch of stuff right up here, a couple of eye widths behind the bead. And if I were to wrap that floss all the way behind the bead, I'm, I'm bulking it up and it's going to be a problem. So I'm going to stop that. Um, Floss a few wraps back. Uh, this pattern adds a white or tan floss to it over this body as an overbody. So here's uni floss in a 1X. So it's a tan floss. So I just need a small length of that. 
and capture this in. Need a clean front to that. And capture it over and then slide it back so I don't have to trim it. And then again, overwrap that. Whoops, there we go. Floss is easy to catch on the hook point, huh? Okay, I got the wire ribbing and the floss to the back, hanging off the bend. Come forward with that. I'm getting a little corded there. I'm going to have to untwist it a little bit. Come back forward. Stop not too far there. Add the floss, avoid the hook point. Every time I wrap, I'm trying to kind of grab right there by the shank and pull down. That keeps that floss spread. I'm just looking for a very light, thin covering, even potentially not covering it entirely, leaving some gaps. Again, I don't want to go too far forward, so I'm going to come back before I get there. Wrap, and you can traditionally wrap this wire. We don't have to counter wrap this. So just some wide, even wraps of the wire ribbing. Uh, this is a brassy size. Uh, you could, if you want the wire ribbing to show up a little better. Use a little uh, larger size uh, of wire, medium or so forth. It'll show up a little better, stand out some more. Okay, again, so here's a case where this is a brassy wire. So I'm just going to come in with my regular scissors, cut it off. It's just faster. All the ideas of helicoptering the videos, I'm like, I ain't doing that. This takes too long. So got a little uh, pink head back there. I do want to leave some room in the front. I'm going to add for a band of contrast in black. So vinyl ribbing. This is flat ribbing in a small. There's also um, a um, midge, which I don't know. Add here a while ago, but that escapes me. So I'll stick with this one. So there's my midge black tubing. And I'm only going to have a couple of wraps of this. So this is where I needed some room at the front because I got to capture this somewhere. It's so small and so slick. And I'm going to wrap back over it. And forward again, and then not all the way to the bead. Just take one, two, maybe three wraps of black ribbing. That first one fell off. So with some practice, this is a very quick fly. Now I want that same pink head left there. So if I had used pink thread, I'd have to be switching here, cutting, retying, remounting the thread but by using that floss. I can use it as a thread. And finish like you normally would. that a little thicker to build some head and taper to that. Cut that very close. Be very deliberate about that. The sloths will tend to spread. Now, floss is very difficult. If I didn't put at least some head cement on it, that would uh, not last at all. Uh, I'm going to put UV on this. So here's there's different brands, uh, Loon and Solares, UV Clear Thin, and 
it's real important on these UV. It's sort of like a ketchup bottle, you know, when they're they're full, it's pretty easy to turn it over and get something out. But after you used it a while, it's only half full. When you turn it over, nothing comes out for a while. So when you lay it down on your table or some other way, it's got a cap on it. You want it sort of turned down like that honey bottle that uh, takes too long to uh, squeeze down. So I'm just going to add this UV all around. Use that applicator to smooth it out. Lay it down on its side. Got there's all kinds of UV lights. This one uh, might be a little difficult to see in the camera, but it's more like a pen. Much more compact. Has a battery inside it there. Rather than those big bulky UV lights, then on the end of it, there's the hole where the UV light shows. So it has a little push button on the side. So I'm just putting my thumb on that push button. That's what turns on the light. And then you can see the reflection of the UV to cure that. Just takes a few seconds. Turn it around all the way. And that one's done. So that's a larger hook. Again, I might often tie that in something a little smaller. But, uh, boy, that'll sink down. And I don't know what it is about that pink. You could try different colors, but that one's done so well, I just I just stick with the pink. Well, I got a whole box of those, and they're pretty quick and easy to tie once you get started with them. Uh, question, Joel. Uh, what was the, uh, what was the uh, formula of uh, UV that you used? Uh, was it the thin or the flow or the heavy? Thin. Thin, uh, okay. I tried the, the regular, the um, thick it's called and there's certain patterns that will you know be okay with that but it just takes too long for it to come out and spread around so with this thin applicator you can kind of move it around smooth it out and get the body shape you want so that's that brand uh, with uh, Loon uh, I also like and have been using uh, let me get it this way. Solar res. I love that stuff. Oh, ultra clear or uh, ultra thin. And both of these are clear that I'm, I'm showing you. Of course, can get them in different colors. And then this particular one has a screw off top with an applicator, but it's a very, very micro sized applicator. So you could, you know, get it in touch where you want. And on this fly where it's all open, there's no wings and other things sticking out. That's not particularly um, important. But uh, other patterns where maybe you're wanting just a little bit of cement and maybe you'd stick the um, very thin tip of super glue or your um, traditional uh, head cement, trying to get it in between, a, you know, like on a post on a parachute or something. Uh, those little thin applicators of the uh, UV bottles really get in between everything else, and you can pinpoint that without gobbing up your other uh, feathers or hackle or wings or tails or something. Okay. Yeah? Uh, I have a question here uh, from Sherry. She said, and I'm a, I think it's for the, uh, the first fly that you tied, do you have a photo of the live bug? Photos of a, a live bug? Is that what you said? Yeah. What are you What are you representing? And she's wondering if you have a picture of it. Um. Well, I do. Um. On my camera and my computer file, I guess, but I couldn't get to that immediately here. So that particular pattern, a twenty incher. With the peacock body, you know, we all love peacock for its shininess and attractiveness and fuzziness. It gives a profile with a little bit of uh, fuzziness to the body. So it's made to imitate a stonefly. I would not call a 20 incher a realistic stonefly, particularly when you, uh, you know, put 
rubber legs on it and so forth. But um, uh, where I've used this same similar style with the jig head and stonefly is in my uh, particular neighborhood. The largest river is the Gunnison River. And not the only river in the West, but not every river has a um, heavy hatch population of uh, salmon flies are commonly called. I call them orange stone flies to distinguish them from golden stones. They're very large, an inch or two long. I've got uh, preserved specimens, lots of photos, and um, you'd use the same technique, but instead of peacock, you'd use some some brown and um, um, orange thread and some different sort of mimic that. Uh, the stonefly hatch on the Gunnison is epic. Um, the way I describe it is, I'm not a big movie fan, but most everybody's seen Top Gun and at the end where there's the big dog fight with the airplanes. Somebody says the, uh, however he says that the uh, other, the enemy, the planes were, uh, the bogeys were like fireflies in the sky. That's what the stonefly hatch is. They are just so thick everywhere. They land on you. It's just incredible. But it's only incredible for about two weeks. So you got to hit it just right. So to the question of pictures, I've got a lot of pictures of those. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Joel before we shut down? Okay. Wait a minute. Here's one that just showed up from Tim. Could you take a moment to address the method for fishing these heavy nymphs close in? You mentioned the pocket water you fish. Oh, I love that question. So um, the more I've learned about fly tying and the more experienced I've had at it, I think the specific pattern matters less than presentation and stealth. So particularly with these tungsten beads that drop very heavy, uh, and are a little more difficult to cast at any distance. You're better off anyway, particularly in you know medium to small streams, keeping your head down, sneaking. You're hunting, and I've moved to ten foot rods, and so I can with careful wading, uh, stealth, and quartering presentation to pocket water. You can get just the right angle, get very close to trout are not gonna see you. And a 10 foot rod, you can lay this down right on top of the rock that makes a pocket or the side channels that go around the rock, will drop right in. And maybe that run is only three feet long and the tungsten bead will get right down into it. So you, you can nymph heavy white pocket water with small pockets, get close and boom, that's where the fish are. Okay. All right. Anything else? Okay. Um, if you'll, uh, if you uh, have a closing, Joel, go ahead. And if not, we'll get ready to shut her down. Well, no, thanks for having me. Uh, just, uh, you know, the technique I was trying to summarize was uh, just the idea of using a jig hook with a inverted tying where the shank is on the bottom and the challenges that presents. So a lot of the technique of tying in the wings and the rubber legs, that's not different. But when you turn the hook upside down, it, it does require a little different uh, uh, steps and dexterity. It's kind of fun, something different. And I think it's very effective because the way it fishes with the eye down and the point of the hook up. Yep. I enjoyed it. It uh I learned I learned a lot. And I'm sure everybody else uh, picked up a picked up a tipper here or two or a lot. It's it's hard to say, but it was you did a good job and I appreciate it, Joel. And if you could unspotlight yourself. Yep. Okay. And uh, I'll have a, an announcement and we'll shut her down.
Thank you very much, Joel. Oh, I Thank got you it. very much. I got it, Joel. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's slow there. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, things just seem to get better and better as we go. Um, our next presentation is going to be the uh, 26th of March. Uh, Tim O'Neill, the owner of uh, Norvice uh, um, Company, will be our, our guest. And he's going to be uh, demonstrating techniques for tying intruder flies. I've seen him I've seen him tie a lot, but I've seen him tie the intruder flies and he has some unique ideas and, and styles and uh, he does a, a very nice job. So if you're interested in intruder flies and uh, I've started using them, they work for trout. I guarantee you that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, please join us. Uh, there'll be an invitation coming out uh, from FFI and, uh, and uh you're uh, you're all welcome and anybody else that you know that you think would be interested they're welcome as well so you can share the uh share the uh, information on how to get onto the zoom so any questions of me before we call it quits thanks very much rick oh you're yes. very welcome um i was scared to death when when uh i got roped into this but <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I've, I've learned to love it. I enjoy it very much. And, uh, by the way, I'm going to start recruiting for next year's or next fall's, uh, series. We'll be doing this again. It seems awfully popular. So if anybody would, uh, would like to step up, um, send me an email or, or, uh, give me a call, whichever. And, uh, I'll, uh, I'd be glad to put you on the list. Thanks, so, Rick. You bet. I thank you all. And I'm going to shut off the recording. And good night, everybody. Thank, thank you. Much. you. Thanks.